Thanks for taking the time to join Cedar Ridge Online and welcome back to our series, Tell Me a Story. We're exploring the stories that Jesus told as he was teaching his followers. And he told them so that his disciples, and, and that includes us, that we might have a kingdom perspective in how we go about things. Today we're going to look at Luke chapter 17 and covering the story of the unworthy servants and seeing, hopefully gleaning, a better way to live for him. This is a picture of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Some people uh, view it as one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. And it's been said that the building's designer, Christopher Wren, went to visit one day to check up on the progress of the building. And um, he wanted to ask some of the workers there some questions, and so he did. And one of the questions that he asked was, what is it you're doing? And one worker responded with, I'm cutting this stone to a certain size so that it fits in that place came up on another person and asked what they were doing, and, and uh, that person said, well, I'm laying bricks in this wall. But one worker who was mixing cement seemed cheerful and enthusiastic about his work. And when asked what he was doing, he replied, I'm building a magnificent cathedral. Attitude is everything, isn't it? It can change the outcome of events. It can show true motives. It can affect the people around us. It can provide energy to start, continue, or even finish a project. And it rings true in our Christian walk as well. It was important enough for Jesus to teach on. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Matthew chapter 18, the unmerciful servant story, this is a parable in which a man pleads for mercy because of a great debt that he owes his master. And he's forgiven of that debt, but then will not turn around and forgive someone who owes him a much smaller debt. And the lesson for the disciples is to have an attitude of forgiveness. Then there's the workers in the field story in Matthew 20. And here a landowner hires workers for his vineyard in the morning, and they agree on a price for the day's wages. But throughout the day, the landowner decides to hire more people to work in the field. And at the end of the day, they all received the same wage, and those who were hired earlier in the day got upset. And it was a lesson for the followers of Christ that they shouldn't have this attitude that they deserve more than other people. And then in Matthew 25, there's the parable of the talents. And in this story, a man leaves and entrusts some money to three of his servants as he leaves. When he returns, two of them were faithful, uh, and they had gave him more money than what uh, he had left them with. But one was labeled wicked and lazy for doing nothing. And a story in which Jesus stresses that his followers, his disciples, should have an attitude of faithful and fruitful service. Attitude is so important in our relationship with God. Notice that in this relationship of all three of those parables that I mentioned, that they talk about the master-servant relationship. It was not by accident that Jesus taught us this through this relationship. I believe it's a reminder for us to realize who God is, the master, and who we are, his servants. And we are to serve him with a certain attitude. Jesus uses the master-servant relationship in the story we're going to study today. And he does once again to teach us an attitude. An attitude in which we should follow or maybe obey him. Let's go ahead and jump in. In Luke 17, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Or won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. You know, if you're reading through, just reading through the 17th chapter of Luke, you might say this is kind of a random story. Because at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is talking about avoiding sin. And then he moves into a part about when people do something wrong against you about forgiving them. And then there's this brief question from the disciples about faith and a response and then all of a sudden the story jumps right in. But I don't think the story is random. I, I don't think there's a portion missing from Jesus' teaching here. I think that after explaining this incredible power that, that comes with faith for the disciples, 
that it might be tempting for them to get a, a big head or to be prideful. And I think Jesus was simply telling this, this parable to be able to uh, stop that corrupted thinking before it even starts. You know, and I think sometimes for us to, to realize that exact relationship between master and servant is hard because, you know, we don't experience it in our culture today. So if maybe it was more set in a modern retelling, let me, let me tr- share this with you. Imagine that one of you owns a small business and you have one of your employees cleaning the floors at your offices or, or maybe the restaurant and maybe he or she is locking up all the doors. Will you tell the employee to come into your office and sit down to help you make a decision to take your company to the next level? Wouldn't it be more likely for you to say, finish locking up and take out the trash, and if you have any ideas for helping out the company, email them for consideration. Will the small business owner find the employee and tell him thank you for taking care of all those tasks? Of course not. He was simply doing his job. And I think the idea here is that the employee is not on the same level as the business owner, The employee is under the owner. He's under him in respect to chain of command or maybe even as in respect to being worth something to the company. In any event, the employee should not consider himself equal with the owner and there's no way that they would consider themselves worthy of being a part of the decision-making process. Back in Jesus' story, interesting that uh, Jesus asked at the beginning to consider themselves being the master. As he says, imagine that you have a a servant. But then by the time the story ends, he reverses that and wants them to consider themselves as the servants. And that's because Jesus is not trying to give us the proper attitude of the master. In fact, he's the master. In other passages, he lets us know how he will act and how he will behave upon his return. But instead, the story is designed to give us insight on how we as servants are to serve. Look there at the very end. It says, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Down deep, I don't think any of us likes it this way. I I think this scenario kind of gives us something that goes against uh, our nature almost. We desire to get recognition. We desire to get money. We desire to get what we deserve. But that's just it. Where we are in relationship to him is already more than we deserve. We're unworthy to come into the presence of the master except for which that grace has allowed. And not one of us should consider ourselves worthy with dining with the master. And of course, this is not a concept that's well received in our society because we've been raising a generation or two that thrives with an attitude of entitlement. It started with everyone getting a trophy for just showing up in Little League, but it's been propelled into adulthood towards the belief that we all deserve the best of everything, and we deserve it now, without saving, without working hard, without any strife. And to be told to simply just do our duty almost comes like a slap in the face. But Paul reminds us this in 1 Corinthians. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This passage sets the scene. It it, it reminds us of who we are. That as believers in Christ, we have been purchased with with the price of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And the response is supposed to be, honor God with your bodies. Once we're allowed into his kingdom, our desire should be to serve him with our bodies. And when we've accomplished what is commanded of us, we have not earned anything. It's not like 10 years of perfect church attendance or 20 years of teaching kids in Sunday school or even 500 gospel shares yesterday afternoon has acquired our salvation. We cannot earn that. It is simply a gift through God's love. In all of this, we have simply done what God has commanded of us. And the reward? Well, we get that because of grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul reminds us that it's not through works, 
that we are saved, but rather it's a gift. But look at what it says. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So how is it that we can go about these good works? Well, I think in the story that we read today, we can discover three ways in which we can go about that. Let's take a look. The first one is this, that we can obey willingly. We've all done it, haven't we? We've all done it in which your mom asks you to do the dishes, and you finally come around to doing them, but you are not happy. In fact, you are banging the dishes around. You're making sure that everyone understands that you're not happy about it. Now, you bang the dishes uh, hard enough to make loud noises, but obviously not hard enough to break because then there would be a whole new uh, world of hurt that came down on you. But it probably even took your, your mom three times of nagging you before you even got off the couch, and maybe you didn't even do that until Dad stepped in and uh, was, there was a threat of losing privileges. You finally do the dishes. That is not a picture of obeying willingly. Why is it that we need to be willingly obeying? If obedience is obedience, does it matter? Well, it comes back to attitude. It's the manner in which you obey. Obeying because we're forced to does not show a commitment on our part. It is simply the fact that we don't want to face any consequences. But it's quite different with obedience to God. You see, he's given us free will. The opportunity to choose to follow him and his commands or to not follow him and his commands. And when we make the commitment and then follow through with our commitment to obey him in all that we do, then we show a commitment to him and a love towards him and a devotion towards him that I believe that God appreciates. Scripture gives us several reasons of why we should willingly obey. Let's look at a couple. First John says, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. One way in which we can show adoration and love back to God is to willingly obey his word. To live as Jesus did. And the result is that God's love is made complete in us. And according to this verse, the marker for someone who knows God is a person who obeys his word. And the flip side, someone who claims to know him but does not do what he commands is called out to be a liar. We show love. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. This passage in Philippians 2 says that we are to be a light. It explains that we, as we obey and fulfill God's purpose, that we live out, we stand out among those around us. The part that gives me hope in this passage is that it says it is God who works in you to will and to act. Thank goodness because left on my own with my selfish desires and distractions of the world, I would probably not get around to fulfilling his good purpose. But the end result as he's working in us is that we shine like a light away to be found for the lost generation. In addition to it, there's one more promise that might help us to willingly obey, and it is this, John 8, 51. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Now it might be good to mention here, it doesn't promise an easy life, but it does promise everlasting life. A physical life of service to the Lord and his commands can result in a relationship with God that will never end. You know, this verse reminds me of a story, maybe because of obedience and death being in it, um, but it reminds me of a story that happened when I was younger. It was a Sunday evening, and, and we were just finishing up the evening service, and everybody was walking out the doors. And, well, they used to have this crow's nest, is what they called it. It was a room in which they would put all the audiovisual equipment uh, up and tucked away behind in the second story, and maybe you had a window to kind of view or listen through. And, and I'm not sure why they did that, because they, 
I guess they thought it was more important that all the equipment be hidden, and that was more important than having the sound tech actually be able to hear what was going on. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, I was up in the crow's nest. I had been running the sound for the night. Uh, everyone was walking out the door. My mom and dad were the last ones out the door. And it was getting ready to shut. And I was kind of leaning out the window, playing or messing around. Who knows what was going on. And my dad looked up and said, you better be careful. You're going to fall. You better come down. Now, I don't know what goes through your mind when you, you see scenarios set up when someone's worrying and, and there's an opportunity for a little fun. That's at least what I thought in my mind. Um, and so as soon as the door shut, I ran down the back stairs, came around the side entrance to the worship center, came in, I yelled, I slapped my hands on the floor, and then I laid there underneath the window. My mom and dad came rushing in the door, uh, expecting the worst, and you'd think as a good uh, son I would jump up and say, ha, I got you good as they came through the door. And no, I decided to wait there, wait and be lifeless. They came in, they ran in, and they knelt down beside me. I'm sure they're getting ready to check to see if I was conscious or maybe even breathing. And it was then that the smile came up on my face. And I'm sure it was even maybe a big smirk on my face. But let me tell you this, it quickly faded as discipline was swift and strong that night. I obeyed, sort of, by coming down. But the attitude of my obedience was all wrong. We need to willingly obey, and we need to obey completely. You know, you don't hear people say things like this. I was watching that soccer game the other day, and the striker was awesome for whole 89 minutes. Or the shortstop was amazing for eight innings yesterday. Or maybe you won't find a better linebacker for 59 minutes of play. Or I've never seen a center go all out for 39 minutes on the court. Why have you not heard these things? Because the athletes that are good finish the game. They don't set out to make it through most of the game. They are out to do their best until the final buzzer. Much like the apostles, we are not, or those athletes, we are not to merely obey most of the time or most of the teachings of Jesus. We're to follow his commands all of the time. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're reminded here not to only teach the disciples everything that Jesus said, but we are to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. This passage is known as the Great Commission. It's the final instructions which Jesus gave to his followers. But look at that highlighted phrase, Obey everything I have commanded you. Is that even possible? Can someone even accomplish that? And the answer is no, and, and I'm sure we've all fallen short of it, probably even today. But I think it might be telling this, this. In our pursuance of God, we are to be driven to know his commands more and more. And as we know them more and more, we are to obey them more and more as we go throughout life. And we don't get to pick and choose the ones in which we obey, but as we come to understand what he is asking of us, we obey it to the very best of our ability. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In fact, I hope that's why, a part of why you are here today, to be able to glean from Jesus' teachings to know how you can better live for him. And as our church mission declares, as you learn that and are better to live for him, then you can help others follow Jesus. Obey willingly, obey completely, obey with humility. When we first started today, I mentioned that Jesus might be sharing this parable for the, the very reason of checking the power that the disciples would feel that they would have with their faith that this power to move trees to the sea or maybe later find out they can heal the sick or even cast out demons would make them feel greater than they actually were. But the power did not originate in the disciples. 
Instead, it was God's power moving through them. And under his will, they were carrying out his um, command. So in all of this, remember that you, that I, that we are workers for the Lord and that he is the one in command. We must have humility. You know, Jesus portrayed this humility uh, in an incredible way. And it's captured in a a fantastic passage in Philippians chapter 2. Starting with verse 6, it says, Who, this is talking about Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. There is no equal to God. Jesus realized this. There's no one higher. There's no one greater. And anything that could be accomplished or done in the world would not change that. We should serve him humbly just because of who he is. Verse 7. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. The idea that Jesus would leave his place in glory and come down to be born on earth and to live as a mere human is, is kind of hard for us to fathom. But it should be noted that he went through great lengths to become a servant. He forfeited glory. He forfeited safety. He forfeited respect. He forfeited authority all to come down and submit to the Father. There has been no greater act of humility. And then look at verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I think when we see that word humility, we want that that easy Webster dictionary uh, definition, right? We want a modest or low view of oneself. That's pretty, pretty easy for us to do. But in the picture of Jesus' obedience, it's taken to a whole other level. It says obedient to death. In fact, it wasn't just an ordinary death. It was the worst death possible. He went beyond the humble part and went into actual humiliation, a degradation of who he was and of his whole body. But we're told all that not just because we get this beautiful passage of Scripture It was shared with us because we are to have that same attitude, that we might pattern our obedience after the life of Jesus Christ, one that realizes God is above all and one that realizes he is deserving of our service and that if asked, we would leave it all behind to obey the commands of the Father. Now I have to confess, I only preach every once in a while and sometimes I forget the basic guidelines of preaching. Uh, the, you know, one of those being that you have to uh, preach for at least 35 minutes. Well, I'm probably going to blow that. And, and there's at least two Greek words in the original language that have to be explained, and I'm probably going to mess that up. And, and there's also, I think you just have three points in the basic outline. And, well, I had four, but I pulled one out. So I'm sure you still want to know what it is. And so I listed it there as the bonus point. But do you want to know what that bonus point was going to be? It was this. Obey promptly. My wife Kelly used to say this to her kids, as the, as our, to our kids as they grew up. Slow obedience is no obedience. So after giving an instruction to, to cleaning a bedroom or picking up toys or, or clothes or whatever it would be, she would wait and see if they would move in that direction. And if they didn't, then out this phrase would come, slow obedience is no obedience. She did this because she knew the human condition of procrastination could easily ripen in our children and might result in the job never getting done. But it's true for all of us, isn't it? Not just for children. When I get that promotion or get everything paid off, then I'll give back to the Lord. When my career settles down, I'll have time to open God's word and catch up uh, on all that he wants me to know. When I graduate, I will have time to share Christ with those around me. I will have more time to show love to the less fortunate when the children get older. Slow obedience is no obedience. It's time to stop making excuses and committing to obeying God with a proper attitude. When we obey in a willing, complete, and humble manner, God is honored and we have fulfilled our duty to the master. Pray with me.
Dear Lord, we thank you for this time to come together and to open up your word. And we thank you that you are a God who has left instruction for us, that we have these stories to be able to pattern our lives after. So we thank you for the direction that comes from those. And Lord, we realize that you are the master and we are servants. And so we commit to obeying you wholeheartedly. We commit to obeying you willingly and with humility. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for those times in which that has not taken place. Whether we have been slow to obey or whether we have just done it with the wrong attitude. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength as we want to obey you, as we want to fulfill the duties that you have for us, and we want to do it with the proper attitude, one like your son Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.